depict the uh, the events that are unfolding here in the U.S. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Talent, who is Vice President of Tactical Operations for Pulse. You can find a complete resume on all three of us um, at the Pulse uh, homepage, the public homepage, which is PulseFirearmsTraining.com. And with that, um, Bill, I think your um, mic is lit up. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, and I'm going to change the presenter and give you the uh, magic wand here. Hold on. Okay, I can see your desktop, and you should be good to go. All right, very good. Uh, now, folks, we're going to continue today um, to uh, follow up on uh, what we've been talking about for the last, uh, the last three webinars. We're talking about fundamentals. Uh, both at the, the cognitive and conceptual level and, uh, and in terms of, of individual skills and proficiency uh, because that is, the, that is the foundation of preparedness for these individual threats and, and challenges that, that, uh, that we're facing. So uh, today, let's start with this. We're going to talk about the armed citizen, and we're going to talk about the training issue. Uh, folks, especially folks who are frightened of uh, uh, of firearms, what some people call the, the hoplophobe, um, who are scared or, or untrusting of their, their fellow citizens uh, who may be armed, like to say that civilians will never be trained to the level of the, the experts of the police and military, um, the people who uh, are the repositories of their trust. But as we've discussed previously in, in, in former uh, webinars, regardless of their respective proficiency, uh, police officers are very unlikely to be there uh, on scene to protect you um, when, uh, when the bad day occurs and, and you face a violent situation. Um, those, uh, including many of us here at Pulse, who have police and military experience know better uh, than that blind faith in, uh, in the experts. Because we know from experience that, that many, many police officers will never use their sidearm in the course of their career. Their, their training priorities reflect the, that fact. Uh, after their initial academy training, uh, many of those officers uh, train and practice infrequently because it is only one of, of many, many skill sets that they, that they must master and remain proficient with to do their day-to-day -day jobs. And as for the military, only a very select few military specialties uh, require skill with a handgun. Uh, most military personnel receive minimal training with handguns, uh, and, and that training and the resulting proficiency levels are generally far below uh, common civilian training standards. And those amongst us on the civilian side who do train also know better because we know that, that there are many sources for training in the private sector. And we know from experience that those who seek out training opportunities uh, have, in almost every case, seen their skill levels rapidly um, uh, improve. And they have seen the skill levels of even raw beginners under quality instruction um, match and exceed those of all but the, the very, very most uh, proficient professionals. That said, we have to face the reality, which is that many citizens that have concealed carry permits do not seek any training beyond the usually minimal requirements of their permit. Many even if they have sought additional outside training, do not have a regular program of practice to maintain their perishable skills. Many of those who do train and who do maintain a practice schedule still do not train broadly enough. And by this we mean that uh, a realistic view of the, of the challenges of a, of a lethal force encounter um, will rapidly convince you that you need a broad, broad spectrum of skills that, uh, that will be necessary.
necessary. And, 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 and let me just run quickly down a list of, of what we consider those skills to be. Uh, they include selecting and wearing your equipment correctly, grip and stance, uh, draw, draw from concealment, presentation, and ready positions, uh, getting hits with practical combat accuracy, uh, reloading techniques appropriate to the situation, remedial action for all common malfunctions performed with two hands and with only one hand, moving off the line of attack and moving safely to cover, uh, conducting sighted combating fire, shooting with the support side, shooting with the concealment garment, shooting in low light environments, shooting with one hand only, failure to stop drills, when your shooting does not achieve the effect that you desire. Shooting from the weapons retention position, utilizing a tactical light in low light situation, dealing with multiple adversaries, shooting from improvised positions, and we could go on and on, but all of these basic skills and more are things that we at Pulse address in our 16 hour combating handgun course. And if you do not train and then and then sustain your skill level with regular practice, um, you're you're probably cheating yourself um, and and contributing to a uh, uh, sort of an unearned complacency in your ability to deal with a, with a challenge. Now we also have this that many people who do train and practice um, do not train to standards. They do not challenge themselves to perform these key, squ key skills quickly and consistently and successfully to a measurable level, level of speed and accuracy. Many people do not train under stress. Training under stress means, perform means performing all of these skills when someone is trying to kill you or when someone is threatening a person that you are responsible for. In, in the chaos and confusion of that moment, um, there's there's no range safety officer, there's no instructor to remind you of, of, of points of technique. There's no one to tell you the rules of the game. There are many many ways that we can um, we can simulate those levels of stress um, to test ourselves and our ability to perform basic skills under those conditions. And then finally, um, many folks who do train and do practice still um, do not go beyond that level of, of individual mechanical skills and techniques to develop the situational awareness and the decision making skills that are, are clearly required uh, in a fight for your life. There are some, some very, very hard and fast um, consequences that will pertain to anyone who uses a weapon in defense of their life or someone else's. Uh, you are responsible for every round you fire. You are ultimately both legally and morally responsible for the final resting place of every round you fire. The decision making that goes into uh, deciding to employ a lethal weapon is a very, very high level decision making skill and, and those who train only to shoot well um, can in reality uh, be more of a hazard to their fellow citizens than they are a help. But even so, we see that people who choose to actually carry a concealed firearm in their daily life, and this, this, this does not include many, many people who even, who even go through the, uh, uh, the, the effort required to obtain a concealed carry permit and to arm themselves, many people do not carry. But those who do, regardless of whether they train and practice as much as they ought to, um, they're exhibiting to us a degree of seriousness and responsibility and self-reliance that a lot of our fellow citizens do not display. And the record, the historical record, bears this out. Uh, if, we, if we look at, at any uh, comprehensive record of the actions of armed citizens, they have a very positive record of performance in incident after incident uh, even lacking uh, professional training. But if those successes are not the result of training, then we have to assume that they're the result of common sense and good judgment 
and, uh, and a very healthy uh, proportion of, of good luck. In the realm of tactics, there's a there's a uh, uh, a term, the advantage of the defense, that presumes that the defender in any uh, conflict situation has certain intrinsic advantages. But in an important sense, that's not necessarily true in the realm that we're talking about now, because in this realm, defending yourself or defending others uh, automatically cedes the initiative to the attacker. The attacker makes the first move. The attacker chooses the time and the place and the nature of the attack. The attacker knows his objectives, knows his limits, and we do not. Um, this is true, except as, as we see here, in the rare case where our situ situational awareness is such that we recognize signs of impending trouble and are willing to break ourselves out of the, the complacency and the normalcy bias um, that, uh, that is developed by you know, just the, the benign conditions of day-to-day -day life, uh, because we have to be willing to act on our recognition of impending trouble and be proactive instead of reactive. Uh, that's an ideal. The reality here is that most of the time, for any of us as armed citizens, the transition to combat occurs suddenly with shocking violence amidst innocent civilians, and the very nature of what is happening to you will not be clear. It is shrouded in fog and friction and chaos. When bullets start flying, we enter the realm of chance and luck and we enter it at a disadvantage, staggering physically and mentally from the initial blow. There is no intrinsic advantage to the defense in this realm. So we train, and we train in order to prepare ourselves to overcome that initial disadvantage and win the fight. Now we can't quantify this. We can't quantify with any certainty what the outcome of a violent encounter is will be. There are too many variables, uncountable variables, uh, that will affect outcome, and, and we do not know until that moment that the situation breaks in front of us what those factors will be. Uh, so what we find is that these, these uncounted factors and variables, the vagaries of chance and luck, are going to be hugely important, and all we realistically can do is mitigate them by our training, by our, our, our courage, our, our, our mental and moral commitment to self-defense, and by technology, by our equipment and our mastery of it. And all that that does for us is improve our odds of prevailing in a fight. Relying upon chance and relying upon hope, or relying, if, if this is more suited to your belief system, upon concepts of fate, none of these are reasonable or responsible courses of action. Ron, uh, if you'd like to jump in here and talk a little bit uh, more about training. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, excellent. Uh, so if you really have heard what Bill has said uh, about upping your odds of survivability in a situation like this, um, you, you kind of hear a reoccurring theme, which is basically simple preparation. And what it boils down for, or what it boils down to, is taking a look at the threats that really face us and preparing for that. Uh, you know, if, if you kind of look at the uh, threats that face you in a daily life, um, nobody looks at you cross-eyed if you uh, maybe limit your fat intake or uh, you know you uh, eliminate certain food groups out of your uh, lifestyle, and if you kind of look at what the National Safety Council has to say about this thing, you'll see that the uh, biggest threats to you, uh, the things that everybody prepares for on a daily basis, um, or, or some people don't, or people you know set their hairs on fire for ex so people that accidentally drowned, etc., and not making light of any of that. Um, you know, it, when we look at all of those threats and, and we uh, start looking how we can do things in our lives to mitigate those, it, it only makes sense then. Uh, to prepare for those things in our lives that uh, are most likely and the most dangerous uh, to us, uh, that we're going to give those uh, attention. Uh, that is simple diet change, or whatever it may be. And if you look at gunfights, uh, they actually barely make it 
to the uh, top 10% gun violence uh, in the United States. Um, and that's according to the National Safety Council. Uh, way below that or way above that are uh, other factors uh, such as uh, falling, people can fall, uh, accidental po poisoning, drug overdoses, uh, land vehicle accidents, strokes, et cetera, et cetera, cancer, and number one being heart disease. Um, and when we admittedly, when we look at these, the, the odds being low, uh, barely makes in the top 10%, uh, according to the National Safety Council. Uh, if we break that down further, uh, we, we'd see that the active shooter, uh, the active murder, uh, more appropriately termed, uh, you know, we're the good guys, we got guns, we shoot back, we're, we're the active, uh, we're active shooters in that sense, we're the good guys. Uh, terrorist activities, those are really, really low on that. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time, very low. Uh, the most likely thing that's going to happen is it'll be up close and personal to you. The FBI uh, tells us that uh, when it does happen, it's going to happen in really close proximity, under 21 feet. It'll be in poor to no lighting uh, available to you. It'll be very violent, and it'll be over with very quickly in a matter of seconds. Um, you are, in effect, you are the uh, first responder on the scene. Um, you know, so uh, in these lethal confrontations, you you're going to have to uh, make the right decisions. You know, if you don't make the right decisions because you haven't planned for, planned for it, if you haven't trained for it, uh, you're going to end up being a statistic, or you're going to end up being shot by the, uh, the people who arrive on the scene to take care of it. That's going to be the uh, law enforcement uh, because you don't know how to interface with them correctly, or just as bad uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you could end up in jail and lose everything you've worked so hard for through uh, litigation. Um, and admittedly, while the mass murder scenarios are low, um, and even thankfully the up close and personal uh, confrontation, while those are low, uh, the nice thing about this, if you really start thinking about it, is if you, you can practice just some practical set, sets of skills, uh, just basic stuff like the stuff that Bill talked about. Uh, just as little as 15 basic gun handling concepts will set you right, right for a lifetime because they're techniques they are common to all fights that could happen. And Bill mentioned that you can learn these things in our 16-hour program. And if you think about that, that's quite an interesting uh, investment of time and opportunity there in 16 hours. You can learn those skills just like you can learn anything else in life uh, if trained properly to greatly increase your odds. Uh, and, and kind of the last point there is, you know, to remember is regardless of the odds, it's not wrong to prepare for those because in the end, if it happens to you, if it falls upon you, you're not going to care at all about the odds uh, because it's you in the middle of that fight and you have to have the skills, whether it's sinking or swimming, uh, whether it's uh, living or taking a life, uh, it's going to all hinge on you regardless of what uh, the odds are at that time. Um, so what we're going to do here is transition into a, a historical example where all these factors uh, came together for a uh, decent outcome that might uh, uh, surprise most of the people out there that uh, do have a fear of guns. And I'll turn it back over to Bill at this time. All right. Let's uh, let's let's review a historical scenario that, that most everybody's probably familiar with to one degree or another. But, but we're going to extract some some interesting lessons and observations from it. And this is the shooting uh, that uh, uh, that occurred in, in 2011 uh, that resulted in the serious injury of uh, Gabriel Giffords, a U.S. representative from Arizona. Uh, on that day, she held a meeting with constituents uh, in a uh, Parking lot of a safe place. Uh, two slides. Um, it was not a large gathering. There were 20 or 30 people uh, gathered around her table uh, and some staff members. The uh, the spooky looking fellow on the right there is, was a 22 year old uh, local uh, Jared Lawson, uh, and without warning, uh, he drew a Glock 19 9 millimeter with a 33-round extended magazine. Um, from a few feet away, he shot uh, Representative Giffords in the head, uh, continued shooting into the crowd. Uh, it was 
later determined that he fired a total of 31 rounds. Uh, six of the people uh, who took those rounds died. Uh, as I recall, five of them died on the spot. One of them made it to the hospital and expired there. Thirteen more individuals were wounded, including uh, uh, Miss Giffords. And as the situation developed, and, and you know, as, as you can imagine, this is in a matter of seconds, when Loeffner, uh, when Loeffner's pistol was almost dry, he attempted to reload, but he, when he retrieved a, a, a new loaded magazine out of his pocket, uh, he dropped it, and a bystander grabbed that magazine. Uh, another bystander uh, picked up one of the folding chairs in front of the table and cracked Loeffner over the head with it, and, uh, and as you see there, a... Uh, a 74-year-old retired colonel uh, who himself had, had uh, uh, taken around uh, tackled Lochner to the ground. And three other bystanders then piled on and assisted in subduing the man. Now here's an interesting piece. One of those three was a concealed carry permit holder, uh, a fellow named Joseph Zamudio. Uh, he was carrying a pistol that day. He was in the Walgreens store next door to the Safeway when he heard the shooting. Um, in an action that is very, very, very uncommon and by no means obligatory for an armed citizen versus a, a public safety officer, he ran towards the scene of the shooting. And on his arrival, coming around one of these uh, one of these brick posts that you see in the photograph on the slide, um, he saw a man with a pistol in his hand. And he later said that he was within a split second of drawing his own pistol and shooting him. But instead, he, he continued towards the man, grabbed him by the arm, threw him up against the wall, and chose not to shoot. Because he realized at that point that this was not the shooter. And his, uh, uh, what he said later is, is the quote you see on the slide. He said, they'd already had a hold of him and there was a lot of people around him, and I wasn't going to cause any more collateral damage or scare anybody any further than they needed to be scared. I felt like I could hold him down and wait for police, and it wasn't my responsibility to end his life. Here's Joe Zamudio. He was 24 years old at the time. Uh, he'd grown up in a household that had had guns, grown up around guns, taught to shoot by his father, but he had never been a policeman or a soldier, and he had absolutely no professional training with firearms. There was a great deal of discussion of every aspect of this event in the aftermath, and there were critics who emphasized how close Zamudio had, Zamudio had come to shooting the wrong person. But, but others uh, were, were quick to point out, and, and this is where we fall on the issue, that despite his, his lack of formal training, uh, Joe Zamudio showed admirable judgment in, in these three ways. He was uninvolved at the outset, and he had no obligation to intervene, but, he, but in spite of that, he was, well, how, how shall we say it, civic-minded enough to move towards the sound of gunfire, um, hoping that he could assist and protect others. Confronting at short range in the heat of the moment, confronting an armed individual, he refrained from shooting long enough to correctly assess the fact that that armed individual was not the threat. Uh, and without ever drawing or displaying his weapon, he pitched in to help others subdue the gunman. In fact, he was interviewed uh, in the immediate aftermath of this incident, and uh, it's, it is very likely that no one, uh, no one in the in the national viewing audience or in the media would have even known that he was an armed citizen if he had not revealed it himself. Uh, he never showed his weapon, uh, and he, he brought it up uh, in a media interview to, uh, to point out that he had been armed but had chosen not to use the weapon. Now here's the timeline. The shooting occurred at 10.10 a.m. Someone on the scene dialed 911, and the 911 call was logged uh, a minute later at 10.11. The police began to arrive at 10.15, the paramedic, paramedics directly behind them at 10.16. That is uh, an extremely fast police response, and it shows you that even when the response is as quick as you could reasonably ever anywhere in America expect it to be, the shooting is usually over before police arrive on the scene. Very substantial casualty count, 
and the situation was resolved. No one else was being shot. No one else was being hurt um, by the time the first police officer arrived on the scene. Okay, now we're going to take, um, we're, we're going to brew up a little uh, pot of stew here. We're going to take several, several elements out of the Gifford uh, shooting uh, and from the, uh, the recent spectacle of, of mounting political violence and polarization in the country. And we're going to construct a hypothetical scenario that presents uh, a very difficult decision-making problem. The, the technique that we use here, as we've, as we've described before, is derived from the uh, U.S. Marine Corps concept of the tactical decision game, where we present a situation um, to an audience of participants, uh, describe it, uh, paint the picture, as it were, and then and then ask participants to place themselves in the situation and consider what their uh, what their next next actions might be. Um, in this case, we adapt that technique and we turn it into a narrative description of an of, a, of an evolving situation. Um, but we have the same purpose of um, uh, of drawing out some uh, some interesting points to contemplate and consider. No matter how straightforward any situation, including this one will be in hindsight in the chaos in which these kinds of events unfold there are frequently no really good choices um, and yet if your safety or the safety of someone you're responsible for is involved um, you don't have the luxury of doing nothing because doing nothing is itself a choice with with consequences so in this scenario we uh, we are thinking of, of, of you and your spouse taking your two teenagers to attend a political rally to advance their, uh, their education. Um, and um, as, you'll, as you'll see as we develop the narrative, um, you probably didn't know how educational the evening was going to become. Here's our situation. A presidential candidate holds a campaign rally in an arena in your city um, despite a well, typically charged atmosphere and threats by the political opposition to disrupt or, or shut the rally down. Uh, a large crowd is assembled outside the arena. Uh, protesters have attempted to gain entrance at various points. Uh, police have their hands full uh, controlling access to the arena, uh, protecting the candidate's route of access and egress, um, parenthetically cooperating with, uh, with Secret Service in that. Um, and in their efforts to keep protesters and attendees uh, separate, in spite of which, uh, you know, as, as we see almost in the daily news now, uh, tempers are frayed, fights have broken out, um, and the rally, uh, although not canceled, has, uh, has finally started about an hour late. You um, are a, uh, a CCW holder. You are carrying a permitted concealed handgun. Uh, and you've carried it tonight even though you're attending a political rally because of, you are aware of, of a possibility of civil disorder. Um, you're concerned about the, uh, the walk with your family from, from the parking garage to the arena. You're, you're uncertain about the security arrangements. Uh, so although you knew there was a possibility that there may be screening at the door and you might not be able to enter the arena armed, um, you, were, uh, you were prepared to turn around and leave at that turned out to be the case. But in fact, long before you reach the entrance, um, you're beginning to reconsider the wisdom of, uh, of bringing your family to this event. By the time you reach the entrance, there's, there are no screening efforts apparent, as the police on site are fully deployed outside, holding the, the hostile crowd of protesters at bay, uh, while you and, and other latecomers are, uh, are working your way into the building. You and your wife and your kids have just entered the building as the candidate steps up to the podium uh, on stage in the arena floor, uh, opposite the foyer where, uh, where you are uh, in the late arriving crowd. So you enter through the doorway with that, uh, with that late arriving crowd. Um, the sounds of the protest outside are cut off, uh, and, uh, and you can hear the, uh, the crescendo of noise and cheers and so forth as the candidate appears uh, inside. And then things turn from merely interesting to, to uh, bad, because you hear a loud popping sound over the cheers of the crowd, the cheers transitioning to screams uh, over 
the heads of the people in front of you. Um, you look into the depths of the arena, you see people on the stage scattering, uh, falling to the floor, and the security detail closing in around the candidate uh, to usher him off the stage. The crowd surges back off the floor, and because the arena is in fact full and crowded, you feel the pressure almost immediately. The crowd is surging backwards away from the stage. Um, you realize that it is continuing gunfire that you're hearing. Um, and, and now, at this point, um, you clearly have multiple threats. There's the gunfire itself, which appears to be coming from more than one source inside the arena. You have the panicking crowd, which is um, a threat under any circumstances, uh, pressing you and your family back towards the entrance that you just came through. And you have the crowd of protesters outside, and a look over your shoulder indicates that that, uh, that, that crowd um, appears to be rushing the police line uh, outside as they and the officers outside become aware of what's happening. Uh, here's a picture of the, uh, the exterior uh, of the arena building in, uh, in a calmer moment. Um, you'll either move with this rapidly panicking crowd out back out through the entry doors and into that plaza outside, or you're going to be trapped against the glass walls and be unable to move at all. So you pull your family together and you push into the crowd of attendees and out the door uh, onto that plaza on the sidewalk. Behind you, the gunfire and noise continues. Uh, looking back, you see the crowd in the foyer that you just departed, parting to both sides as people press away, stumble, fall to the floor. You are, at this point, about 10, year, ten yards uh, away from the door. Uh, when you, uh, you find one of those uh, three-foot uh, concrete planters, you pull your family together on the, on the lee side of it, uh, protected from the crowd. And the, uh, the people uh, exiting the foyer continue to flow around you uh, into that plaza. A little ways beyond them are the police lines and the protester crowd on the far side of them. Fifty yards away from the entrance, uh, are the police lines. They're backing up under the pressure of the crowd outside as, uh, as you know, bricks and bottles, and chunks of concrete, and water bottles, and anything that comes at hand are flying through the air. Um, the crowd is violent uh, and very agitated. And now, as the, uh, as the crowd thins in the foyer, you see two men run out through those suddenly empty uh, doorways. Uh, wearing jeans, sneakers, bulky hooded sweatshirts, pulled over their faces. One of them turns in the doorway and you see him throw what appears to be a long gun uh, onto the floor before he emerges uh, out through the entry doors. They stop a few yards past the doors and no further than that from where you and, and your family are. You see a pistol in the hands of one individual. The other's hands appear empty. They look around assessing the situation. Obviously, uh, uh, thinking of what their next move is going to be, and one of them looks directly at you. So now we would ask these questions. What is coming next, and what will you do? If you, in fact, are this individual in the situation we've described, I mean, obviously, um, you know, you, you have very little time, you have limited information, you have a good deal of pressure and several several threats and possibilities of looming immediately in front of you. So here's four options that you might consider in this, in this um, split-second decision process. You can draw your firearm from concealment and fire at this armed suspect who appears to be presenting an immediate threat to you and your family. The second course of action you might consider is to get your, your family on their feet and get them running directly away from the gunman and his companion. Um, as fast as they can and hoping that you will not be uh, the next target set. The third possible course of action is to break your break eye contact with the, uh, with the suspect, uh, get everybody down on the ground and, uh, and hope for the best. And the fourth course of action would be to uh, um, perhaps mimic uh, Mr. Zamudio and rush the suspects without drawing your weapon. If none of these look to you like very, um, uh, very attractive.
attractive or likely uh, to succeed options, I would I would say you're probably um, you're probably thinking uh, you're probably thinking very rational. Let's consider these options in a little bit more detail. Okay, course of action number one: engaging with your concealed handgun. Here are the issues that, that confront that choice. Your target already has a weapon in his hand and he's looking at you. Do you have the skill, composure, speed, and technique to overcome this natural advantage? Can you get a weapon in your hand and deliver accurate, effective fire on a man a few yards away from you who already has a weapon in his hand? The second suspect may also be armed even though you haven't seen a weapon yet. The the mob or protesters behind you engaging the police are already violent and aggressive and, and may be further incited by gunfire. Um, people in these situations have a tendency um, under that kind of provocation to either um, to either run or, um, or continue and speed up their, uh, their aggressive activity. There are presumably innocent people behind and to either side of the suspect and as your vision narrows down under stress, uh, your chances of detecting people running in all directions who are, who are probably about to run between you and the target decline uh, towards zero. There are police officers behind you uh, in almost every direction from you dealing with immediate violent threats in front of them and aware of the gunfire from the arena behind them, um, which of course suggests that, that being uh, being a person who is not a uniformed police officer uh, with a weapon in your hand uh, may not be conducive to um, survival and, uh, and good health. Your family is all around you, and no one has directly threatened your family yet, but the moment your weapon appears, you will become a target who will draw the attention and quite possibly the fire of the suspects. All right, let's think about the course of action, which is to run away. You hope that the gunmen are more concerned with their own escape than with shooting you. They might choose to shoot you, and you might get lucky and they'll miss. And finally, if they shoot and they don't miss, you might be lucky enough to, uh, to stop the bullet that is meant for your wife or your child. Um, and, and we've spoken you know, in, in uh, previous webinars that, to, to the fact that uh, hope and luck do not constitute strategy. This doesn't look like a very attractive option. Of course, action number three, uh, do not engage, do not run, get everybody down on the ground and hope for the best. If you recall the coverage of the terrorist attacks uh, last year in Paris, you'll remember the story of the, uh, the lady was, uh, that was sitting at the table outside the cafe in Paris who, with her friend, took shelter under the table uh, while the, the shooter at that locale was, uh, was shooting uh, several other individuals. Uh, he walked over to the table, shot her companion, pointed the weapon at her, and experienced a malfunction. Uh, instead of clearing the malfunction uh, and proceeding to shoot her, he moved on. Uh, so once again, we're looking at, uh, at uh, chance and hope. Uh, this is the rabbit strategy. Rabbits who freeze uh, sometimes escape the predator. And finally, course of action number four, rushing the suspects without drawing your weapon. Um, well, unfortunately, there's two of them. One of them is armed. Both of them may be. They are clearly killing enabled. Um, you have no reason to believe that these are any other than the shooters who have done a substantial amount of shooting. Uh, and mayhem already inside the arena, so they are probably not going to hesitate uh, with you. There's, you have no indication that anyone else is prepared to assist you. Um, so the best you could hope for with this course of action is that you might distract the suspects um, long enough to allow your family to escape, uh, if in fact there is a path of escape available uh, in this situation. So we ask this, are any of those courses of action attractive? Are any of them likely to succeed? Are there other courses of action? And, and, you, know, and, and you all you know, uh, follow along with the conversation here. You may, you may think of something else. Um, but there are 
not too many options, and the way the, the way that the human mind functions under stress, um, the compiling of alternatives and the analysis of alternative courses of action is not something that proceeds um, very very methodically or rationally in a situation like this. This situation is what we uh, what we call a wicked versus a tame problem, and there are some characteristics of the wicked problem which apply to this. Uh, contradictory and changing requirements, solutions that are difficult to recognize or identify, uh, the fact that constraints, conditions, and resources change rapidly over time. Uh, you had a different situation uh, inside the foyer of the arena than you have now outside cowering behind the planter. Uh, typically there is no time or very little time in order to devise a solution and implement it. There is not with a wicked problem, usually a large set of alternative solutions. Uh, every potential solution you look at is going to either reveal or create a more complex problem or worsen the problem, that, the primary problem that you're facing. And finally, and this is the thing that, uh, that bedevils us when we attempt to train or prepare ourselves mentally for these kinds of situations, is that the wicked problems are essentially unique. Um, lessons learned and experiences that, uh, that we bring to the problem from elsewhere uh, may not apply. So is this a problem that can be solved by shooting well? Uh, perhaps, but it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be uh, a much more viable solution than any of the others we looked at. Is there any good answer to this problem that we've, we've portrayed? than to not have gotten yourself into the situation in the first place. And so finally, we point this out. Um, in this situation, you cannot expect, regardless of your level of mental preparedness or the level of physical skills you have, you cannot expect to shoot your way out of the consequences of prior bad judgment. Self-reliance and self-defense is not easy. Now we. We drew this scenario the way we did um, in order to in order to assure some of you who may who may have been with us uh, through some prior scenarios that we are not um, we do not lean hard towards the idea that an armed citizen is capable of or obliged to act as a hero uh, stepping into a crisis situation, uh, drawing a weapon and engaging. Um, there are there's a there's a high component of uh, of unrealistic fantasy um, in some of those assumptions. There are many many situations that are not going to be resolved or not resolved successfully by being quick to go to the gun, uh, and we just presented you with one of those. But because we like happy endings better, let's back up a little bit. We're going to rewind and we're going to consider a happier branch to this scenario, and it will take us out towards another uh, possible conclusion. In this variant, both you and your wife are armed, and you've trained together to the same standards. As the shooting begins, you see a side corridor leading off from the foyer. So rather than flow with the crowd out into the plaza, you push your family down that hall, hoping to find an exit that will allow you to bypass the mob outside. You see exit doors ahead, down at the end of this corridor. Um, they appear to open onto a side street. And you see concrete bays and dumpsters and a lamp and a ramp leading up to the higher street level. But as you approach that exit, another corridor intersects the one you are in, leading from a side exit from the open arena. As you pass the opening, you hear a loud gunfire once again. You look down that corridor and you see two men carrying long guns turn from those double doors into the arena and run down the intersecting hallway toward you. You tell your wife to get the kids outside to the next nearest covered position and to cover the exit. You will be right behind her. You draw your weapon as you turn. You lean out around the corner of the intersecting hallway. You're still not entirely certain of the identity of these two individuals, so you shout stop to observe their reaction. The one in the lead raises his weapon toward you as he runs. So you fire a quick control pair of shots at that lead runner. You can't tell if you hit him in the low light, but both runners swerve into doorways on your side of the hall as you follow up with another string of shots. Their, their forward progress is at least temporarily stopped.
several rounds come down the hall as you duck back around your corner and run for the exit, reloading your handgun. You push through the exit doors. You see your wife 15 yards up the ramp at the corner of a steel dumpster. She lowers her muzzle as you run toward her. You grab the kids, push them ahead of you. No communications are necessary. This kind of basic maneuver is the sort of thing that you have trained for with your life. As you reach the top of the ramp, you see the protester crowd down the street to your left, oriented on the main entrance. The street to your right is mostly empty. And a half block away is the arena's multi-story uh, parking garage. You hear gunfire behind you. You turn around to see the glass of the exit door shattering and two forms recoiling back away from that doorway. Your wife then turns and runs toward you, and you point her past you to where you've already sent the kids uh, jogging towards the A little bit later, with no further activity at the exit door, you turn, reholster your weapon, uh, because you're out on the street now, and there's no immediate threat. You run to catch up with your family. You enter the parking garage. Uh, a few minutes later, you're on the third level of the garage at your car in a position that allows you to control all approaches to your position. And uh, you are at least momentarily safe, uh, listening to the, uh, to the noise and, uh, and chaos outside and preparing to stay in that position until your own observation and your cell phone contact with the authorities convince you that, uh, that it's safe to leave. A far 